abstract, but hey, they did a good job. So, all right. So good morning, everybody. And um, a quick um, Torah study here today about whether God cares about you. Do you think God cares about you? Absolutely. Oh, you do? Good. I, I, that's, that's big progress. I like that. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Um, a lot of us struggle with that. A lot of us struggle with that. Nikki, what do you say? Do. You do think? Do. How about if you're like not a good person? Do you think God cares about people that are on, on, on perfect juice? Yes, he does. He cares Absolutely. about these he two. He cares to about them too. Okay, he wants us to return to him. Fine. Okay, good. Um, do you think that God has any patience for like, I mean, if it's taking you 3,000 years and you're still struggling with being a Russian, you know, you have three, three levels, the tzaddik, the Russian, and the Benini, right? You know what they are, right? Yeah. The tzaddik is the perfect Jew. What are you talking about? You know, you're, you're kind of company here. The tzaddik is the perfect Jew. This is the Jew. Remember, we have two souls. This is basic Tanya, the godly soul and animal soul. They're in tug of war. The tzaddik is the one who has transformed his animal soul to serve his godly soul. Like a horse and a rider. You know, that you put them in a room and it's going to be not pretty. You put a horse and a, and a person in a room, they could, could get bloody. But if you tame the horse to serve the rider, huh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, right? This is a tzaddik. He has a horse and the horse serves the rider. Doesn't fight him, serves him. That's a tzaddik. Then you have the Benini. The Benini, the horse and the rider, they don't get along with each other. But the horse knows who's boss. That's it. The horse doesn't serve the rider, but he knows that all decisions are made by that guy. That's the Benini. It's constant in, in a conflict. Right? Constant. But at the end of the day, the bottom line, he does the right thing. Thought, speech, and action. The Russia, total chaos. Total chaos. Sometimes the horse wins. Sometimes the, the human wins. It's complicated. It's bloody. It's it's painful, right? These are the three kinds of Jews: the tzaddik, the rasha, and the benini. The, let's call it the Jew of self mastery, the Jew of inner turmoil, and the Jew of total chaos. Right? You got those three. Fine. Now, does God care for the third one? Seriously, uh, can you relate to any of those? By the way, all of them. Yeah. Well, not the tzaddik so much. <laughs> Not that side that. Yeah, but total chaos. I mean, think about it. Yeah, I think we don't relate to the total chaos. Yesterday's Tanya. You learned yesterday's Tanya? Beautiful Tanya yesterday where um, the chassid of the, of the Alter Rebbe, his name was uh, Reb Hillel Paracher. He was an accomplished Torah scholar before he ever came to Chabad. A great sage amongst the, the Orthodox Jews. He knew the Talmud forwards and backwards, you know. And he came to, he comes to the Alter Rebbe and he was convinced that he's a tzaddik. Convinced that he was a tzaddik. And yesterday's Tanya, Tanya chapter 27, al Rebbe says that when you realize who you are, when you when you realize the difference between Tzaddik and Russian Abenini, you realize Halavai, you're a Benini. You know what Halavai means? If only, if only I was a Benini, a middle Jew, the middle, the in-betweener, the, the struggling Jew. If only I was the Jew of inner turmoil, right? The Jew of uh, self-mastery, forget about it. Not happening, right? The Jew of total chaos, very much relate to. In a, in a conflict alone, I wish, if only that was me, right? So, so when, when Reb Hillel Paracher learned Tanya chapter 27, he was one of the greatest chassidim, and I want to tell you, when I wrote Vyadai to Moskva, it was inspired by a discourse written by Hillel Paracher on the Alter Rebbe. This, this guy was like half a Rebbe, this chassid, right? He, he said, when he learned Halavai Benini, Vonia Benini, he realized <laughs> that he had to lower his whole uh, self, uh, his self uh, uh, assessment, self appraisal, because he had thought coming from the wrong context, you know? Halavai Benini. So, so let's learn about this in the context of the sixth Torah portion, you know, because does, does God have any patience for imperfect Jews? I mean, think about it. Imagine somebody comes up to you, Jan, and he says, um, I'm sorry that I was rude to you yesterday at the, the buffet. What would you say? Okay, thank you. Imagine he was rude to you again today. And then tomorrow he says, Jan, by the way, I'm sorry that I was rude to you at the buffet. Imagine that this 100 days in a row. <laughs> how would you feel about that? <laughs> you stop the, you'd be in another room. <laughs> like, like how, would you, how would you handle the situation? <laughs> Yet we, how many times a day do we say, Hashem, Hashem, by the way, um, I'm sorry about what I did. How many times a day do we do that? Three times a day, right? And if you don't dive in three times a day, if you come to show once a week, Yom Kippur, we, we schedule Yom Kippur. We pre-schedule our atonement. By the way, next year, August 14th, I'm coming to ask you forgiveness for all the things I'm going to do to you until then. <laughs> How would you feel about that? I mean, 
Like, seriously, out of your mind? Like, get a life. Pull it together, man. Seriously, you know? <laughs> Are you serious or not, right? So how does Hashem deal with us? How does he have patience for us? And this is what you realize when we say in the in the Tachman, we say, Erech HaPayim Rav Chesed He's He's very long patience. Endless patience, right? This is great. You're a great lexicon. I love your lexicon. I love having you and studying you with you. It's beautiful. Um, endless patience. Now, if you had endless patience, you'd be like, no problem. The hundredth time he asks you uh, an apology, you'd be like, no problem. Sounds good. Sounds good, right? But if you have not endless patience, of course you, would, you wouldn't manage, right? So how does Hashem handle us when we're so far we're so flawed. We're so broken. Let's take a look at this Torah portion to give us the most beautiful insights. It's page 485. God spoke to Moshe saying, we learned this yesterday, but we're going to learn a totally different angle today. Speak to the Israelites and have the treasurers take the materials that the people donate for the tabernacles from their personal belongings as a contribution for me. Tell the treasurers, you must take the contribution for me from every man whose heart prompts him to give. So they got to want to give, right? There's no forced, uh, what do they call them in the... Uh, in the HOAs, uh, forced assessments. Yeah. Assessment. yeah, yeah, those aren't pretty, hey? No, tell me about it. <laughs> Put a lean in your house or something. No, 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 it's for only those who want to give. Okay. The following materials constitute the contribution you must take from them, gold, silver, and copper, of which they have plenty from the spoils of Egypt and the Sea of Reeds. Now, I've got a question for you. Gold, silver, and copper. Gold, silver, and copper. Is there something wrong with that? Think about that. You building a house for God? For God? You building a house? Look at the next verse. In verse 8, they must make me a sanctuary from these materials. When they do so, they must specifically intend thereby to infuse holiness into the materials. The purpose of the sanctuary is that I may dwell in their midst. You building a house for God out of what? Gold? I get it. Silver? Yeah. Copper. Copper? Gold, silver, copper. Cook industrial electronics. Seriously, you're building a house with God out of copper? That's a little embarrassing, isn't it? Isn't it embarrassing? Now you, 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 you have your, nice wife, metal. your wife's 50th anniversary. Wife, I've got you a, a present. Copper what did I get you? I got you a copper, copper uh, necklace. Copper, copper kettle. A copper kettle. What you going to do to you? Seriously. Hit you over the head with you. Yeah, like, like, yeah, I got you a copper kettle, right? Beautiful. You know, you heard about that. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. Lynn would love it. Hmm. Would Jackie love it? No comment. <laughs> Chuck, in, in, oh, really? in, in, no, I'm talking in, about the in necklace. Kitchen, it's all copper. copper you know, copper. fair enough, fair enough. Okay, no, I know nothing about cooking. <laughs> Seriously, I know nothing about cooking. But assuming that copper is the inferior material for jewelry, assuming. Oh, pennies of copper? Okay, fine. So let's say you got your wife a, a necklace made out of pennies. I, I don't know if she'd appreciate that. <laughs> I never tried it. One time, by the way, when I was first married, when I was first married, I heard about this Meshugas. You had to buy flowers. I buy flowers every week. I was crazy. I don't remember this business. I had to go and find the flowers of water. The third week, the third week, I was like, why don't you get flowers? Brilliant. I went to a special store. You know, they sell the petrified flowers, the dead ones, the, the pre-murdered flowers. Yeah. The dried flowers. Yeah, the dried flowers. And I brought her the whole thing. I'm like, we're good for every week now, for the next 20 years. Right? We're good. I'm still here for a few more minutes, yeah. So, um, so I brought these flowers. Let me tell you, if looks could kill. No, no surprise. <laughs> um, the there, the there was this husband. There was this husband who forgot his wife's anniversary. He forgot his wife's anniversary. Wife's anniversary. She, yeah, yeah, his wife's birthday. Sorry, his wife's birthday. <laughs> so his his wife looks at. Him, she's so mad. She's so mad. You forgot my. You forgot my 80th. Seriously, you forgot my 80th. We're married for 60 years, and you forgot my birthday. She said, if tomorrow morning, if tomorrow morning there's, there's not something in the driveway for me that goes from zero to 200 in under four seconds, in under four seconds, we're done. On the driveway tomorrow morning, you hear me? Zero to 200 in under four seconds. The next morning she wakes up, she's shocked. She sees there's a little, a little package in the driveway. She goes over, she unwraps the package. It's a bathroom scale. <laughs> the funeral's on Monday morning. <laughs> when do you start saying no. that's hilarious? Okay, so so back here, back here. So we're building a temple, Michael. We're building a temple for God in this week's Torah portion. Oh, we have a jeweler here. Let, let, let me let me ask you this question. We're building a temple, right? So the temple was built. Now, 
How would your wife feel if you got her uh, jewelry made out of copper? Not very nice. See, I, I, even I knew that, <coughs> right? Okay, so I was right. I was onto something here. Okay, how about if you got it out of silver? Still not so happy. Not so happy. It's not as bad. Not as bad. Right? It's not a bathroom scale, but it's right. Okay, so gold. You want to get gold? Maybe platinum. Right? Platinum. We learned in today's Torah portion that God. Okay, now. <laughs> Okay, so now it says in the portion, gold, silver, and copper. Why gold, silver, and copper? You're building a house for God out of gold, silver, and copper. Isn't that embarrassing? Seriously, you're building a house for God out of... Imagine you built a, a shul out of, uh, uh, I don't know, out of thatch roof and uh, plywood. Yeah, plywood. Or or maybe mud hut. Well, mud, mud hut. I'm going to Africa, right? Mud hut and a thatch roof, right? Seriously, that's embarrassing. You're building a house for God out of copper. So the Rebbe points out and takes a look at this. And here's what the Rebbe says. He says that the, the, the three metals, this is good for a jeweler to hear. Good for a jeweler, Michael. The three metals represent three kinds of Jews of divine service. The word silver in Hebrew, kesef, silver and money is the same exact word. Because the word for kesef means desire. Why is money called kesef? Because that's what people desire, right? Silver... Interesting, it's the same exact word. So what that, what kind of Jew is that referring to? This is the Jew that yearns, the Jew that pines for who? For God. A desire, the Jew that had a desire for God. The, the silver Jew, that's the tzaddik, that's the, the righteous Jew, the perfect Jew. This is the Jew of self-mastery, who's, who's tamed his animal soul, his animal soul works for his godly soul. This is the silver Jew, the Jew that is yearning for God. Then you have the gold Jew. Who's the gold Jew? Who's the top of the food chain? Who's oh, hey. no? Who's the holiest Jew? Who's the holier than than, than the righteous Jew? The tzaddik. Navi. We have three kinds. Remember, we have the the, the tzaddik. The, the right. No, no, hang on. There's the tzaddik, the rasha, and the benini. Right. The tzaddik is the perfect Jew. The rasha is the uh, is the struggling Jew, and the benini is the is the Jew that that uh, has inner inner conflict but manages on the outside. Right. So so. Oh, sorry, but th th there's another kind of Jew. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Oh. So there's the tzaddik, and there's the, the, the penitent, the Baal Teshuvah. Ah. So there's the perfect Jew, the one who never sinned, and then there's the penitent, the one who, who found his way back home. Right? This is the penitent Jew, right? So the Talmud tells us that the place that the, that the, repentant, that the penit penitents, penitents reach, even, even the, the, the most righteous Jews can reach. Right? Why? Why is that? The Talmud says, because this one never sinned. But this other one has tasted the sweet taste of sin and has chosen to walk away from it. That's much, much more difficult, much more noble. So if you've been to a dark place and you've pulled away from it, mm -hmm. much higher than the Jew who never sinned, right? So if you think about it, right, the guy that came from the, that came from the south side of Chicago, right, the guy that came out of the, the gangland, right, and then wow. became... The and then, is that where Midway is, Midway Airport? And, and that's where... Um, and, and then he found his way to Torah and Mitzvahs. Is actually much higher than the rabbi that never sent. I mean, not this rabbi, but other rabbis, right? <laughs> right. right? But think about it. But the thing, think of a perfect Jew who might have never sent. The, the Jew who did the shuvah is actually much higher. So that's the Jew that's called gold, the highest level. About whom it says that that you, nobody can can reach that level. And then who's the copper Jew? Copper represents <laughs> the Jews that. You know, what, what's the word copper in Hebrew? Nechoshet. Nechoshet is the same root. As Nachash. Anybody know what Nachash means? Nachash is the snake. Mm. And who's the snake? The snake is the one that caused the first sin, right? The, devil. the what? The devil. The, the, uh, yeah, well, we don't really believe in the devil, the devil per se. We don't believe, but in the Garden of Eden, evil. exactly, the, the snake was a personification of evil. He was the one that, you know, motivated Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. It's a whole spiritual symbolism. But we don't technically believe in a, de in a devil per se. Everything is part of God. I think the devil Satan. is is um, Satan is a holy Satan is a holy angel of God that works for God. The devil, I believe in other religions, and I don't know this for sure, but I think that the devil is like an agency outside of God. I think uh, Michelangelo is Sistine Chapel. I think you got you got the good side and the bad side. There's no such thing as good and bad. There's only only God. Only everything is under the auspices of God, right? Anyways, but the Nachash, the snake, is the is the is the temptation to evil. So who is the Nechoshet, the, the copper, which has the root of snake? That is the sinners. That's the Jew that sins, which is the Russia, the wicked Jew, right? So three kinds of Jews. You got the, the, the gold represents the, the tzaddik, the perfect Jew. 
The silver, sorry, silver I'm sorry. The gold silver. represents the Baal Teshuvah, the one, the penitent, right? That's the penitent. The, the, the silver represents the tzaddik, the perfect Jew, and the um, copper represents the sinful Jew. Who builds the holy temple? Says the Rebbe, the Torah is telling us explicitly who builds the holy temple. It's every single Jew. We need every single one of us because if one Jew didn't do his part, then what happens? The whole thing falls apart, right? You know, if you, you can use an analogy of an airplane. If you're on an airplane and... Um, the cargo door blows out. The cargo door blows out. Or imagine you, <laughs> imagine you decide to do some remodeling in your seat. Imagine you decide to do some remodeling in your seat in the airplane, right? It's my seat. Leave me alone. It's my seat. Don't get involved in my business. It's my seat. I'm, I'm digging a, a tunnel here, right, under my seat. I want access to the cargo. What? Or in a boat. Same thing in a boat, right? You make a hole in the boat, right? Either way, what happens is you dig under your seat. The hole, you bring down the whole collective. Right? Together we rise and together we fall. Right? So, so what the Torah is telling us in this Torah portion is that you need all three Jews in order to build the holy temple. You need the tzaddik Jew, the gold, the silver. You need the penitent Jew, the silver. Sorry, the penitent is the, the gold, right? Gold. And you need also the sinner Jew, the, the copper. Don't exactly. You need the now, where does the Bainini fit into this? Yeah, I think that the Bainini would probably be. The Bainini would be the, would be the gold. The Bainini, because the Bainini is the guy, he, he's the one that's oscillating. Yeah, he's the one that's like sort of in that inner struggle all the time. So that would be the Bainini. So maybe it's 14 karat gold versus uh, 22 karat gold. I don't know. There's different <laughs> kinds of tzaddik, by the way. You'll learn in Tiny Chapter 11. You've learned this already in Tiny Chapter 12. I know there's different kinds of tzaddik. What? Oh, you, that's, that's how you make different carrots? Oh, so they're blending. They're blending. I didn't realize they're blending. Okay, fine. No problem. Okay. So so I just want to wrap it up because I've got a flight to catch. That um, in Hebrew, you know how you say the word congregation? There's another way to say the congregation. No, that's a house of gathering. Uh, that's the children of Israel. The way is Sibur. Sibur. Like, for example, the Chazan. What's the Chazan called? The guy leading the congregation. It's called the Shliach Sibur. What does Shliach mean? Shliach? Shluchim? Guide. Shluchim is a messenger, right? Yeah. So the shlech is the messenger of who? Of the tzibur, of the congregation. That's the person that leads the congregation, the shlech tzibur. The word tzibur is a fascinating word. It's tzaddik, beis, resh. The word, the three letters, right? It's actually four letters. There's, a, there's a, 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 an invisible vav in there, but don't worry about the vav. Tzibur, right? The three letters of the word tzibur, the three root letters of the word, represent the three kinds of Jews that make up a congregation. The tzaddi re represents the tzaddik, Silver. The base represents the Bainini, the imperfect Jew, the one in a struggle that's the base, the Bainini, that's the gold. And the Reish, who's the Reish? The Russia. What happens if you don't have any wicked people in your congregation? I you got a tzab. You don't, you don't have a tzibur. You got a tzab. That's why right? So welcome. That's why we welcome them all. You're a sinner. Come to that's join the club. Here, right? I'll see you at the bar, right? If you've got some sins <laughs> behind you, no problem. In fact, sins serve to serve as your greatest impetus. You know, just to remind you, one of the greatest revolutions that I feel for the Rebbe taught is that sin is not something to be afraid of. It's like the, the drawback of the bow and arrow. The drawback is a, is, is a negative experience. Pulling a, you know, I'm pulling away from my target, right? I'm pulling it away. That's a negative experience. But the Rebbe said, no, 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 no. Use the momentum to, to fire closer to the target. If you just go like this, you might not hit the target, right? But if you go backwards and then forwards, you have a much stronger momentum to be able to hit your target. The Rebbe said, you're a sinner. No, mazel tov. Take that sin and turn it into gold. Baal Shuba can reach higher than the, than the tzaddik, right? This is the secret of the congregation. And hence, the lesson I want to leave you with today is if you're a wicked person, so when I, what does it mean wicked? What does it mean wicked? You're not a wicked person. Like we learned to the Rebbe spoke into the prisoners the other day. You're not a, you're not a bad person who, had, who, who had, uh, made bad decisions. You're a good person who made bad decisions. That's it, right? So let's not let's talk about wicked people. If you've done wicked choices, don't ever judge yourself by your worst decision. Mm -hmm. If you're a person that's made uh, uh, bad choices, okay. You're precious before God. You're copper. But the definition that's finite. I mean, we Finite? As, as we live our lives, we move back. Absolutely. You've asked today. We're dynamic I mean, human beings. You can shift. Absolutely. And, so, and some parts of your life, you're gold. Right. And some parts of your life, you're copper. Even during the course of the day. But when it comes to my marriage, I might be perfect uh, gold. When it comes to my parenting, I might be a little copper, right? When it comes to my relationship with God, I might be silver. You know, you, you shift it around. Right. And then there's your brother-in-law where you're totally, uh, I don't know, you're like uh, paper, 
right? Your relationship, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, we, uh, in order to build a home for God, God wants it to dwell where? Not in, in the bricks and mortar. He wants to dwell in us. How does he dwell in us? If you show up. All of us have to show up. The entire congregation, the entire tzibur has to show up in order for God to be able to have a home. And that's why, does God care about you? About you? Does God care about your service? Does God care about you notwithstanding your continued mistakes? 100% he needs you. God leans on you. Make sure to show up to make the difference, to build the, the temple for God Almighty. That's the oh, mission of our generation. Thank you, folks. Safe travels. Thank you. So, oh, so, so I won't be doing classes for the rest of the